بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه. So I received many many questions. Actually, I received some questions as soon as just a couple hours ago, uh, to the point that I couldn't print them. So I have to read the first a few from the phone. The first question. The effectiveness of prayers for the dead at the gravesite versus from elsewhere. Is a physical on-site visit to the grave of a loved one more effective than a virtual prayer? If souls are not physically bound to their graves, does it matter where we pray? For example, if one's in a different country and unable to visit family graves, the thought is Allah would accept our prayer from wherever we are. Please explain further. So it is whatever we do on behalf of the deceased, whether it be uh, making dua for them, reciting the Fatiha for them, reciting Quran for them, etc., etc., wherever we are, that reward will go to them uh, and they will benefit from it. Going to the grave itself, that's for us. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ala you know, go to the graves, visit the graves, because it will remind you of the akhirah, it will remind you of death. Um, so the, the, the distance when it comes to these matters is not important. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, says, said that whoever sends their salam on me, I receive it and I respond that salam wherever, wherever they are. But going to visit Rasulullah that's for us, the living, you know, so we feel that closeness, etc. So, uh, no, wherever the distance is, you can say the dua and inshallah the dua will, will benefit them. Second question, the awareness of souls when we visit their grave sites. Are souls aware where we are visiting their graves? I greet everyone when I visit a sibling's grave locally. Uh, we're supposed to do that, I believe. But if souls are not physically in their graves, do they know we are visiting? No, that is the that is the place of the of the of the soul. Uh, but the soul is not tethered uh, as heavily to the body as it is during our lifetime. Uh, and when you go to visit a loved one or anyone for that matter, they hear and they are aware of your visiting. Uh, in the hadith after the battle of Badr. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu you know, went to the graves of the, uh, his enemies vanquished, and he spoke to the graves, and he said, did you find, you know, what Allah, uh, uh, God's promise to be true, and I found God's promise to be true, and he kept going by grave, grave by grave, and the Sahaba said, you know, Ya Rasulullah, what do you say, they're dead, they don't hear, he said, no, they, they hear just like you hear, but they cannot respond, and this was for the kuffar of, of Quraysh, so, of course, this applies to the believers as well. Allah's acceptance and answers to our prayer. In trying to explain the nuances of his answer, especially the ways in which he answers, I don't think I clarified well enough explaining this to someone. I welcome your thoughts on acceptance and answers both. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears all of our prayers, all of our dua. That is a form of Allah Ta'ala answering because it is rewarded. So the act of dua itself is a reward. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ad-du'a huwa al-ibadah. And in another, hadith, another narration, Ad-du'a ibadah. The dua is worship. The, 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 the act of calling out and asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that is the fundamental quintessential component of all of our acts of worship because it acknowledges our need and that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can fulfill that need la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah so we, that itself is a qurba the, the act of asking is is a, is a devotional act itself but i want something specific allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can choose to answer that or not to answer that or to answer it in a different way or to prolong me getting it or to give me another version of it or to block this so that something else may happen. I mean, there are all of these permutations that can happen. So inshallah, our, our du'as are answered. Our, first of all, our du'as are heard and they are rewarded. And inshallah, they are answered. 
But we do not know ultimately where the khir is. And that's the point of being patient and that's the point of being content is that we do not know exactly where the khir is and what we have asked. But we always have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The salawat and non-Ramadan fasting. My aunt was discouraged saying salawat while walking. I am surprised. Please illuminate. No, the, the, the salawat on the Prophet Wasallam is accepted universally even from a non-believer. Because if a non-believer were to say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, for example, you know, oh Allah, send your prayers and salutations on Sayyidina Muhammad. Allah Ta'ala will, despite their disbelief, send his salutations on the Prophet Sallallahu So this is a, a universal qurba. There is no limit to it. There are no boundaries to it. There is no limit to the extent of our devotional practices towards the Prophet Sallallahu or our love of the Prophet Sallallahu or our praise of the Prophet Sallallahu You know, there's nothing that can stop that um, because there is nothing greater in the created world greater than Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. هو الحبيب الذي ترجى شفاعته لكل هول من الأهوال مقتحم. Imam al busiri says in the, in the Burda poem, he is the beloved whose intercession is sought against all of the calamities that we face in this world and in the next. So no, there, are, there are no limits to salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu at all. Um, what are the best days of the week to fast? Monday or, and or Thursday, the Prophet Sallallahu fasted as a sunnah fast Mondays and Thursdays, he was specifically asked about his fast on Monday, and he said, On Monday, this is a day in which I was born. So it's as if the Prophet ﷺ celebrated his birthday every week by fasting on Monday as an act of devotion of qurba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Mondays and Thursdays are sunnah fasts. There's also hadith that talk about fasting the middle uh, days of the lunar month the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th of every lunar month. Those are also Sunnah days to fast. Um, but that being the case, I would not, I, I would encourage people, if fasting is difficult, if it's a difficult task, when you feel the desire to fast, just fast. Don't, don't say, oh, I'm going to wait to do it the day after tomorrow because it's an optimal day. Don't do that. Just don't let anything prevent you from committing to the to the devotional act. If you're, you know, a regular faster and you just you're asking because you want to adjust, you know, Mondays and Thursdays and or the three middle days of the month. Of course, then there are the occasional fasts. There's the fast of Ashura, the tenth of Muharram, which is you know highly recommended. At one point, it was a fard for the Muslims to fast before the obligation of Ramadan. And then there is the fast. Um, there is no real uh, strong hadith on the fast of the month of Rajab. I, I think I believe Ibn Hajar al um, Ibn Hajar al Asqalani has a book about the hadith that are narrated in the fast of Rajab, and I don't think any of those are necessarily strong. Uh, but at the end of Rajab, to commemorate the Isra al Ma'raj, one can fast, and certainly Nisfu Shaban, which will be upon us soon, the fifteenth of Shaban, the night before is a blessed night. Uh, for dua plus the day of the 15th of Shaban is the fast the Prophet Sassan didn't fast in any month more than he fasted in the month of uh, outside of Ramadan in the month of Shaban as the Hadith states and then the first nine days of Dhul Hijjah uh, particularly the ninth the day of Arafah the day before the Hajj so these are some of the also this occasional Sunnah fast Can women do atikaf during Ramadan at the mosque if there is a separate section? Yes, inshallah. Can we ask an idol worshiper such as a Buddhist or a Hindu to make dua for us? I mean, I wouldn't state the I wouldn't state it that way. Um, you know, think well of me. Uh, pray for me is sort of like a almost like an expression now that doesn't necessarily mean make dua for me uh, but there's no there's no harm in in being cordial with them but i wouldn't necessarily ask you know for prayers okay uh, now to my my list of questions In a typical average of one hour window between fajr and sunrise till when can you still pray before it is considered makruh. 
the prayer time of Fajr begins with what is called astronomical dawn, which is a you know, very technical term, and Fajr, as Sadiq, as it's called in the books of, of Fiqh, the true dawn. And it lasts until the disk of the sun begins its ascent on the horizon. The minute that the disk of the sun is seen, that is the shuruq, which means before the disk rises in the horizon, the rays of the sun are still uh, illuminating the, you, you know, the horizon. So there is some light out. So if you prayed, for example, at, towards the end of Fajr, like in summertime when Fajr is so early, many of us pray towards the end of the Fajr time, it will seem like there's still some light out. The makruh time is to wait till the very end of the prayer time, but having enough time to, to, to say, uh, to pray both, uh, both rakahs. So you have to look at the, at the schedule to see what the time is. The makruh time of any prayer is delaying the prayer unnecessarily towards the end of the time of prayer. The best time to pray is obviously the beginning time. I mean, there are different opinions about that across the Madeha, but generally speaking, when the then comes is the, is the best time to pray the, the obligation as a habit. Prophet Muhammad Sassam's heart was taken out and washed with Zemzem before, during the Ma'raj. How many more times his heart was washed with Zemzem and was there any scar in his chest? The Prophet Sassam's heart was washed uh, the first time when he was a child uh, with Halima Sa'diya alayhi salam. And then a second time when the Prophet Sassam received the revelation on the night of Laylatul Qadr, the night of Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. And uh, a third time, as the question states in the Isra'ul Ma'raj, and some debate whether it happened a fourth time or not. And the Sahaba who described the physical appearance of the Prophet, ﷺ, they did say that they saw a scar that, you know, that went, you know, basically towards the left side of his chest down to his navel, uh, you know, as a straight line. There was a physical scar that was seen uh, by the Sahaba around him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I was going to the masjid for one of the prayers. I got pricked in my thumb and it bled a little. Do I have to make wudu again? No, there are, uh, there is something called excusable amounts of filth. So the, the dinar, the coin, the gold coin, which is a little smaller than an American quarter. If you have less than a dinar's you know, like that, less than a dinar's amount of najasa, of, of ritual impurity, blood or urine or something like that on your body or clothes, it, while you're praying, it's, ex, it's excusable. Um, so if you were, you know, you prayed and then you finish the prayer and you look down and, you know, there's a little nick here or nick here, that, that's okay. That, that doesn't invalidate the prayer. Nor do you have to necessarily pray again or make wudu again. Are Shias considered Muslim? I have heard that they believe that Sunnis have taken verses out of the Quran and they believe that the 12th Imam governed the world alongside Allah. Is this true? No, the Shias are Muslim. Anybody who faces the Qibla and anyone who says the Shahada is a Muslim. Uh, that is the, the, the definition. So the definition of Muslim is very wide and all of the sects uh, that we know of, are we consider them Muslim, unless and until something appears from them that violates the, those like basic, you know, things. Now, the, difference, the differences between the Sunnis and the Shia are, are many, but most of those differences can be reconciled as differences of interpretation or differences of opinion. However, there are five issues between us and the Shia, which are substantial. And it is it, the discussion or the reconciliation between the people of Sunnah and the people of Tashaya are on those five issues. The first issue is, as the questioner said, the uh, infallibility, the isma of the 12 imams. The 12 imams are also are, are universally accepted as imams. I mean, the Sunnis have the same love for the family of the Prophet والسلام, as the Shia, and we honor and we revere uh, the 
the, the 12 Imams, the descendants of, of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam. And, but they say, or, or some of their works say that they are infallible. We do not believe in any infallibility after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Infallibility, al-isma, meaning that they are a source of tashriya. They are a source of uh, uh, establishing legislation. Now, that is only for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, we believe that those 12 imams are saintly and are protected and are pure and are wise and, 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 and many of them were ulama of the outer and the inner, etc., etc. But that doesn't mean that we would say that they are, uh, they are infallible. But they are at the same level as all companions going down uh, because there is no infallibility after the Prophet sallallahu The second issue is the issue of the cursing of the Sahaba. There is a literature in, in the, the world of Shia Islam, uh, horrible literature of the cursing of the Sahaba, the Sahaba that fought in the great fitna uh, between Imam Ali alayhi salam and Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Uh, and they fought against Imam Ali, like Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Aisha alayhi salam, etc., uh, there is a literature and a tradition of cursing those Sahaba. Now, I mean, cursing the Sahaba is, is an enormity beyond, you know, one, one's, one even shudders just to think of the thought. Sayyidina Aisha uh, alayhi is a is a, um, from the mothers of the believers, from the text of the Qur'an, Ummahat al the Qur'an state, I mean, is the Qur'an making a mistake therefore? I mean, it, it, it brings up so many theological problems. Um, you Believe, we believe that Imam Ali was right, by the way, and Imam uh, and Sayyidina Muawiyah was wrong. But that does not stop us from saying Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu anhu or Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, etc., etc. And by the way, a lot of the narrations and a lot of the details of the stories that happen of the fitna between Imam Ali and Imam Muawiyah uh, are wrong and forged and incorrect, uh, by the way, you know, on that issue. So that's the second issue. The third issue, as the questioner mentioned, is tahrif al-Qur'an. Is that some uh, in the Shia literature say that there is uh, uh, parts of the Qur'an or that have been changed or that have been altered. Uh, and even there's a, a, a well-known book by one of the Shia ulama, At-Tabarsi. Um, is it Nursi? At-Tabarsi, At-Tabarsi. Uh, Fasl uh, al-Khitab Fasl al-Khitab fi tahrif kitab ulil al-bab or something like that. Fasl al-Khitab is how I remember the shortened version. Anyway, there is a tradition that they believe that the Quran has been corrupted, etc., etc. Uh, of course, we believe in nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. One of the miracles of the Quran is that it has been pr- 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 protected and preserved and there is no evidence to the contrary. The fourth issue is a theological issue uh, called al-bada, which is a theological issue that means, as we understand it, that God changes his mind, which is a a huge theological problem. Uh, We do not believe that Allah Ta'ala changes his mind. Uh, And the fifth issue is the issue of the tuqya or of, uh, you know, hiding what one believes in, uh, etc. Now, these five issues, of course, the Shia have responded to. I, I mean, I'm just stating the problem as it exists from our perspective. But for the last almost 100 years, 80, 80 years plus, this reconciliation between the Sunnis and Shias has uh, emerged. And uh, the major maraja and uh, ayatullahs of, of the world of Tashayu have responded, and no, this is not what this means, and no, this is not what this means. And we condemn those that, that curse the Sahaba, etc. And that, it's upon that, those responses that this reconciliation has taken place. But yes, th- those traditions do exist. And uh, because those problems are so enormous in the scale, uh, unfortunately, the burden is on the people of Tashaya to make a better effort to, to clarify their position on those, on those issues. To say, to say that the Sahaba, to curse the Sahaba is essentially to curse the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, stuff for Azim to even think about that because the, the definition of the Sahaba are the people that the Prophet Sassam saw, the Prophet Sassam dealt with. They are his companions. So did he make a mistake or did he fail in his mission? 
I mean, all of these theological questions happened that obviously, no, that, that would dismantle our belief altogether. So there are enormous issues, but they have been reconciled. So the, the upshot or to go back to the original question is no, we, we, we hold the Shia to be our brothers and, and sisters in faith. We consider them Muslims. Of course, there are different types of Shia. The Zaydi Shia of Yemen, uh, which is a form of seven Imam Shiaism, are closer to the people of Sunnah. They're very close to the Hanafi Madhab, for example. Uh, and then the larger group of the people of Tashayya are the Ithna Ashariya, the Jafariya, the, the 12 Imams, Shia, the Shia of, uh, of Lebanon, of Iraq, uh, of Iran, uh, etc. Um, and then the Ismailis uh, are another form of seven, uh, seven or people of Tashayya, and they claim that they follow Jafari Fiqh. Uh, and the Ismailis are also are subdivided into other groups. So there are different sects, but universally, anyone who says the kalima, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah praise the five prayers towards Mecca, uh, is a Muslim. <clears throat> uh, must one read durood for the dua to be accept for their dua to be accepted? So what's the shortest durood? Now Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will accept anything. Insha'Allah, our our opinion of Allah Taala is is high, but to put ourselves in an optimal state for us to, or for the du'a to be accepted, we should send prayers on the Prophet Sassam before the du'a and after the du'a. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa Ali is a, is a short version that's, that's easy. I think it's important to say Sayyidina Muhammad, you know, our master Muhammad, and to remember the family of the Prophet Sassam because of their purity and because our love, for, and for our love of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam. What are the Salafis and Wahhabis? Should we stay away from them? Salaf, the, the, the Salaf is a term uh, that the Muslims use to describe several things. In one opinion, the Salaf are the first three generations. The generation that grew up around the Prophet, the Sahaba, the generation that grew up with them, the Tabi'in, the, 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 the followers, and then the generation that grew up with them, Tab uh, Tabi'in. That's the, the narrowest definition. The second definition that's a little bit larger is this is the first three centuries of Islam. And then the third definition, which is even larger than that, is that the end of the Salaf, uh, the, uh, the time of the Salaf ends with the beginning, uh, uh, the end of the fifth century. So it would end with people like Imam al Ghazali, who died in 505 of the Hijra, Imam al-Bayhaqi, who I believe died in 504, radiallahu anhu ajma'in. So it's a term that we use to refer to the earlier generation. We are the Khalaf. We are those that have come after the year 500. A couple of centuries ago, about 200, 250 years ago, there emerged this idea that uh, the Muslim world has become dilapidated, has lost its way, has uh, ceased in power. I mean, it, which, which is true, it has ceased in power, been occupied, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, uh, the error of our way, the cause of our downfall is that we have strayed from the path of the Salaf. So we need to go back and revive that, you know, that type of Islam. So this is where the idea of the Salafi thought or the Salafi movement uh, comes comes in. And the problem with that is that what ends up happening is that people erase, want to erase everything that's happened from the time of the Salaf to our time and sort of cut it out as a time period, take it and remove it, and wants to put us here in you know, 1443 and put us all the way back to the year 200, for example. But that is not the way of, of the Ummah. The Ummah is, it builds one generation over the other. One generation receives from the generation before it and passes on to the generation after it, adding its commentary and, and uh, its understanding, its wisdom, its inherited wisdom. That's what makes uh, our civilization one of the greatest civilizations to have ever existed uh, amongst humankind is that it is robust, that it's dealt with all of these permutations and historical instances. And we have found nonetheless that our Quran and Sunnah to be equally valid now as it was at the time of the original revelation. But the Salafi 
the concept is to erase all of that and to go back. But Salaf and salaf, the Salaf, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a time period. It's not a madhab. There's no madhab called the madhab of the Salaf. That term or concept never existed. There is no hadith, for example, narrated uh, by the Salaf. So and so, the Salafi, who narrates on so and so, the Salafi. That doesn't exist. But I, I carry a chain of transmission, for example, from me back to Rasulullah or back to Imam Shafi'i first, and then from Imam Shafi'i to, to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all narrated by Shafi'is. So my teacher, so and so, the Shafi'i said. His teacher, so and so, the Shafi'i said. His teacher, so and so, the Shafi'i said, etc. That that Imam Shafi'i. Uh, radiallahu anhu said etc so the shafi is a madhab you have the you have the same hadith for malikis for example or you have hadith that are transmitted by certain acts the hadith transmitted by laughing or the trans the hadith transmitted by shaking the hand so on and so forth but there's no so there's no tradition there's no tradition that's narrated by the salafi it's not a, it's not a movement it's not a concept it's not a madhab it's a time period that we revere and we honor the people of the past so the salafis uh, that's sort of where it starts. And from there, you know, kind of all hell breaks loose from there. And then there are multiple, multiple, multiple permutations of this thought until our age now. The Wahhabis are one manifestation or one popular or well-known manifestation of that thought. Uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah, rahimahullah jamia, who emerged in the Najd area of the Arabian Peninsula and also held these same views uh, that there was this quote unquote uh, cult of saint worship. The people were going to the graves and visiting the graves. We need to demolish these graves. We need to bring back Tawheed. And as a matter of fact, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, his own brother, wrote against him. And his own father kicked him out of his study circle. Uh, and this was a person of great fitna. Uh, and he aligned himself with the Al Saud family in the beginning, and they rebelled against uh, the, you know, the Ottoman controlled Arabia uh, in the East. And then they, they conquered the Western part of Arabia, including Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, and united it all under one kingdom, you know, the Saudi kingdom. So that's a very specific thing that happens uh, historically in that part of, and gives rise to the modern kingdom of, of Saudi Arabia. Now, this issue of, of the, the Salafism, I mean, forget the Wahhabi because that's something very specific, but just the general concept as I've outlined it, you can see that there are problems with that concept uh, and it's inconsistent with our intellectual heritage uh, and it's the cause of great fitna. Many of these questions that I get every month come from that uh, mentality. Not that you have that mentality, but are, you are influenced by that mentality. It's, it's sort of out there in the ether. The, uh, and we've inherited that. And it's created great, great atrocities. Uh, and one of the permutations of it is that it, it, it gives rise to extremism. It gives rise to extreme Muslim thinking. And that extreme Muslim thinking gives rise to violence against Muslim states and violence against Muslims and violence against Muslim minorities. This recent bombing in the uh, Shia mosque, in I think it was in Pakistan, uh, persecution of of, of Shia in Sunni majority countries, uh, you know, the, the abuse of women, uh, so on and so forth. It comes from, it's born out of this concept. But we didn't have this problem before. Why? Because Islam is inherited one generation after another, one generation after another. And then therefore we retain the wisdom of the past. We retain the commentary of the past and then we build and we continue to build so that we can add wisdom and we can add experience to the generation after us but when you cut things out and have a selected view of your intellectual history then you're going to create all of these inconsistencies and that's unfortunately you know what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal this wound this is the great cancer that has befallen us this is the challenge that that we of today this is our challenge as Muslims that we have that we need to fight against this uh, uh this aberrant way of thinking, and we have to revive once more the, the glory of our intellectual history, 
uh, an understanding of both the letter and the spirit of the revelation of the Quran and the Sunnah. Is it permissible to use hookah, such as when at a restaurant that offers it? The ulama differed uh, on the, uh, their opinion towards tobacco use. Uh, this tobacco is something that emerged as a new thing, as coffee did, for example. Uh, and there are all sorts of opinions from it's permissible to it's recommended, to it's makru, to it's haram, etc. The reality of the matter is that there are different types of tobacco use. Uh, tobacco, which is addictive, such as cigarette tobacco, uh, addicted, addictive, uh, that has addictive chemical components, you know, that stuff is all deemed haram. Uh, because of its, its established harm that it causes. But there were many ulama of the previous generation that smoked and that used tobacco. Uh, and um, th th those people would argue that it's makru. So it's the, the dominant opinion today or of the majority of fatwa uh, bodies is that you know, smoking is haram. That's just sort of the default. But there are other opinions that would say that it's disliked and it's makru. If it's something that's done occasionally and its harm is minimized and managed in that way, you know, one could say that it is makru. Obviously, it's safest to stay away from it uh, and not to develop the habit to start out with. But that's sort of how I look at it because something like the hookah or shisha, um, well, you know what? It, it's, it's harm is bad and we should stay away from it. Let me just say that, let's say it like that. How should I select which meds have to follow? My parents and family are Hanafi, I think. I learned how to pray based off a video, which I think follows the Shafi Madhab, so I don't know which Madhab to follow. As I've said in the past about the issue of Madhabs, the Madhab is a construct that is used uh, for the student of sacred knowledge, the person who is training to learn Islamic law, hopefully to one day teach that madhab and to answer people's questions. As the way I'm answering questions, for example, for you, uh, it's not necessarily a construct that is used by all Muslims. So there's a difference between the person who has engaged in the selective uh, systematic study of Islamic law, the, you know, was, as we say, the student, the student of sacred knowledge, and the average Muslim. The average Muslim has no mufti, uh, has no madhab. Their madhab is the madhab of their mufti, as we were taught. Meaning that, that your madhab is is what your imam tells you when you come and ask a question. How do I do this or how should I do that? That then becomes your opinion. Because there are multiple madhab. There's not just one madhab over Islamic history. We've had over eighty of them. And to be able to answer people's questions in the public square, you need to be able to know how to choose from the different madhahib, how to be able to find opinions that are compatible for people's circumstances, so on and so forth. So uh, the person who teaches you, the person who you ask, that becomes your madhahib. It's on them, therefore the burden is on them. If you want to study Islamic law at a deeper level, you have to study one of the madhab, one of the four madhabs, because you can't study Islamic law except by studying one madhab. Yeah. You have to st study one system of legal thought. And over the course of years of studying, you end up learning about the other opinions and other madhab, so on and so forth. Do the jinn have the ability to physically harm us, or are they prevented from doing so by Allah? I think I recall hearing about how Iblis took the form of a man and joined a war against the Prophet Sassam, but ran away. Yes, the jinn can, can physically harm us. Uh, it is possible. Uh, the harm is, is easily repelled by the basic things that we do, by keeping our wudu, by making sure that we you know, clean ourselves after the bathroom, by making our, saying our prayers, by reciting al-fatiha and ayat al-kursi, and the last three surahs of the Quran, you know, those basic protections ward us, ward off that harm. Because Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, in the kayda shaitani kana da'ifa, that the power and machinations of Satan and his minions is weak. It's weak. Min sharr al waswas al khannas. Al khannas is the, the shaitan throws uh, a whispering at you and then runs away. Al khannas, they run away, they're scared. 
So yeah, there, the, the, technically that can happen, but not, not at the level that people think. It's not like some cinematic you know, arch enemy that's gonna bring about the, the destruction of humanity. If anyone's gonna bring about the destruction of humanity, it's us, you know, not the jinn. If some, someone didn't wash Janaba, is their Juma prayer halal? La, the question is, if somebody didn't is in a state of Janaba, is their Juma prayer valid? No, the prayer is not valid, it's invalid. Uh, you have violated one of the conditions of the prayer, which is to be in a state of tahara. If you are in a state of Janaba, then you have to do your ghusl uh, and then uh, make up dhuhr prayer for rakats because you missed Jummah. And if you didn't know, then there's no sin involved, but that's the correct procedure in that case. Islam believe in Allah, Christians believe in Jesus, so my question is, who, what do the Jewish people believe in? All three of the, the faiths, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as, a, as a bare minimum, uh, which is why they are considered the monotheistic religions, alongside also with Zoroastrianism, which is a, a smaller, uh, unfortunately, fading religion, only maybe a few hundred thousand left, probably at most today. But the concept of that tawheed is different for the faiths. So as we know, the Christians believe in the Trinity or some version of the Trinity, which means many, many different things for all of the many, many, many different sects of, of Christianity. Uh, are they three separate entities? Are they related? How are they related? Is Christ also divine? Is Christ not divine? I mean, there are, and, and the, the Christian, the early Christians fought wars with one another. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, if you read in, in Edward Gibbon's uh, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, I mean, one, one of his volumes, I remember he talks about this problem and, and some, of the, some of the bloodshed is, is unbelievably horrific. I mean, I've never, I, I couldn't even believe that that stuff actually happened over these theological issues between Christians on the meaning of the Trinity. So, you know, we have, I'm not an expert or we have absolutely no time uh, here to describe the differences, but there is some version of the Trinity. The Jews also uh, are monotheistic. They believe in, in God, Yahweh. Um, you know, Shema Israel Adonai Elechinu Adonai Echad, the famous uh, Hebrew prayer. Hear, O Israel, your Lord, uh, our God is one. Achad, Wahed, you know. So they, they are monotheistic, but they, they might have different ideas about what is permissible for God, what is oblig obligatory for God. We are pure monotheists. And if you study Islamic theology and you study the, the science of Tawheed or Usul al-Din or Aqidah, it has different names, but it's the same subject, you will learn that we have a very consistent, very clear, absolute, pure monotheism. La ilaha la, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. So the problem or the, the differences come in what do we mean by there's one God. Uh, and there are many texts, Jewish texts, for example, that would allude almost to an anthropomorphic concept of God. But we reject any, any, uh, any concept of anthropomorphism, for example. But there's still muahidun, there's still uh, you know, monotheists. Catholics have saints, Muslims too have saints. Please clarify. The saint in Islam is the person who is, has achieved a consistency in their worship, an istiqama, that they are always praying, that they are always making the dhikr, that they are aware, that they have tamed their nafs, uh, so on and so forth. And when we find a pious person, uh, whether they be a, a, a scholar or not, uh, anybody can be a saint. But when we find a pious person uh, and when their dua is accepted, then we say this is a uh, wali from al awliya. So these are one of the friends. The, the, the saint in, in the Islam is called al wali. Al wali is the friend of Allah. In awliya Allah la khawfun alayhi wa lahum yahzanun. Indeed, the friends of Allah uh, have no uh, sadness upon them. So it is the person who has achieved this consistency and this purity. So when we look into the past, we have no doubt that Imam al-Shafi'i was a saint. We have no doubt that Imam Malik, that Ahmed ibn Hanbal, that, that Imam Abu Hanifa, that Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam, that were saintly people. And we consider them from the kibar al-awliya. 
We have no doubt that Rabi al adawiyya that Imam al-Nawawi, that Imam al-Ghazali, radiyallahu anhum ajma'in, were from the saints, were from the awliya. And we continue to benefit them from them. And, and many of them, we follow their spiritual ways, whether it be uh, the likes of Imam al-Junaid or Abdul Qadr al-Jilani or Shah Naqshaband or Abu Hassan al-Shadili or Ahmad al-Rifai or al-Chisti or Mawlana Rumi, radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. So these saintly people, uh, many of them will leave a path, you know, a, a formula that if you follow this formula, you, you will arrive at that purity uh, as well. And this is the discipline of Ihsan, of Tazkiyah, of Tasawwuf. Uh, in the Catholic world, it's, it's different. You know, they have a committee and they have to meet and they have their, all of these conditions. And one of the conditions is there have to be, I don't know, X number of miracles that have been witnessed by different people. And then somebody on the committee has to be the devil's advocate. That's where the term comes from. It has to argue against, against you know, uh, the, the person being canonized. And then if they agree and they vote and they sign a piece of paper, then that person is now canonized. They bring them to the canon of the, of the, of the um, family of saints. And they, you know, this is the, the patron saint of, of sailors and this is the patron saint of you know motorcycle riders and the, and it's it's a very different process for us the greatest miracle that you can achieve in your life is to be consistent that's the greatest miracle and as a matter of fact the the big awliya the big uh saints in islam do not have miracles they're not the people that fly in the air and walk on water that's for the junior Awliya, the, the, the massive awliya, their, their wilaya, their sainthood comes simply from being consistent. And that's why I say it is, it is one of the rarest and hardest things in life is to be consistent. But that is where greatness comes from, is from that consistency. So that's a little bit about the awliya. If while passing urine, some of it splashes on my clothes, pants, etc., do I need to change my clothes, wash my clothes, or can I simply wipe the area of the clothes so soiled? What if some urine splashes on the leg while my wudu is my wudu nullified. No, the existence of the najasa does not nullify the wudu, but the existence of the najasa needs to be purified by water. So if some urine falls on someone's pants, for example, you can just wet that pot, that spot, and then that would clean it. Automatically it's clean the water, has that cleansing uh, capacity. So it doesn't negate the wudu at all. Uh, you just have to make sure that your clothes are not carrying that najasa uh, because if you pray with najasa that is large enough, the prayer is invalid. You have to remove that najasa before you pray again. What does Islam say about the environment and greening? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu said, do not harm the earth because it is your mother. So, you know, that says it all. The, the earth is our mother. This is, and the mother is the source of mercy, is the source of life. Uh, the, the womb of the woman is called a rahim and a rahim comes from rahma. Uh, so if the Prophet ﷺ likened the earth to our mother collectively, then we must show earth mercy towards the earth. The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, as is narrated in, in, in uh, narrated by Tirmidhi, ar-rahimun yarhamuhum ar-rahman tabaraka wa ta'ala irhamu man fil ard yarhamkum man fil sama. The merciful ones receive mercy from the merciful ones. So show mercy to all on earth. Men fil ard, all on earth, including the earth itself, including the animals, including the environment. You shall receive mercy from the one in the heavens. So our way is the way of mercy. And uh, when it comes to the environment and the natural surroundings, we have all sorts of traditions about water use, about trees, about greens, about fruits, about animals. Uh, you know, inna Allah katab al ahsan ala kulli shay. The Prophet Sallallahu said, ahsan, perfection, excellence has been prescribed over everything. So when you slaughter your animal, ahsin al qatla, you know, make that excellent by sharpening the blade, by diverting the animal's vision, by not having the animal be anxious, by making it happen quickly. So in that there's mercy. Because when the animal is, is super jacked up with, with, with fear, and that fear and, you, and the animal is killed, as unfortunately happens with modern uh, slaughtering uh, mech uh, uh, procedures, 
that the 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 hormones that are that are sent out at the time of the execution, but that's in the meat that we eat. So we end up consuming that kind of stuff. So there's a great hikmah in what the Prophet Sassam is saying, you know, in those procedures of how the animal is slaughtered, for example, or our engage rules of engagement in warfare about not harming the environment and no scorch earth policy, so on and so forth. There's great wisdom in that because that's the source of our agricultural. Uh, I mean, look now with this uh, fight in the Ukraine, people are talking about grain and, and food shortages and fuel. So we have rules of engagement uh, for those great, great wisdoms behind that. Islam is probably the most green of all of the faiths because we have clear texts that talk about that, that talk about the earth, that talk about water, that talk about rainfall, so on and so forth. Um, so that would be a great subject for us in, a, in another venue to delve into because there's so it's very very rich and very very beautiful. I am a diabetic and I need to inject insulin. Will my fast be valid? I really want to observe my fast. Any intramuscular injection does not invalidate the fast, but an intravenous injection would invalidate the fast. So an insulin shot is fine while you're fasting. Inshallah. In some communities and Islamic countries, it's a must for women, or sorry, it's a must for men to cover their head with a skull cap or a cloth. What is the accepted practice in the days of the Prophet and what was the ruler of the practice? The difference of opinions amongst the madahib. The Hanafis believe that it is a, I believe it is a condition for the prayer that the man's head be covered. Uh, but that's just a legal opinion. Uh, clothes in general are custom, custom-based. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, most men covered their heads. They wore a turban. You know, the Prophet ﷺ wore a turban. Um, amongst other head coverings <clears throat> or a cap. But, I mean, at times, you know, they would remove it, of course, if they were sleeping or washing, you know, making wudu or something like that. In some, at some times in early Islam, it would be considered improper for a man not to have their head covered. In those times, a lot of the literature about the head covering uh, uh, would, would indicate, for example, if a man came, if a man didn't have, uh, uh, didn't cover his, his head, then you couldn't accept his testimony, for example, in, in court, because it was a sign uh, of a morally corrupted person or somebody who was not morally upright or trustworthy. Because that's part of the package at that time. But that doesn't, that's not the package now at all. So it's customary. So for men, you don't have to cover your head. It's a sunnah to cover your head. Uh, and it's a sunnah to cover your head when you pray, for example, uh, in, in the dominant uh, opinion. Although I travel during Ramadan, I like very much to fast. Understanding that there is a hadith that those who do not take advantage of the exemption given in the Qur'an might not be pleasing to Allah your guidance. No, if you are able to fast in this, uh, in this circumstance in Ramadan, it's better to fast if you're able to. You have the dispensation uh, to break your fast and to make it up later. But because it's Ramadan, you know, you know we all feel the same way. Well, I would just rather fast. It's, it's Ramadan. So in that case, it's fine to fast. As long as you're not harming yourself, by the way. Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan, could I pray to Hajjud soon after Taraweeh and I need to get some sleep before Fajr and go to work? I mean, you could, or you could consider Taraweeh to be, you know, it's a, it's a sale, it's a two for one. It's, it's Taraweeh and, and Tahajjud. Uh, so Qiyam doesn't have to be a separate, separate act, especially if you're going to have to sleep and then wake up for Sahur and go to work. I want to motivate my kids who are seven and eight to fast, even half a day, your guidance. Yeah, that's important. The, the earlier people fast, the easier it becomes. When you fast when you're young, then you are comfortable with that sensation of, of being hungry and thirsty, the sensation of the fasting person. The longer you delay that, the harder that sensation uh, becomes to, to live with. It's not impossible, of course, but it just becomes like a big chore or a big task. But when you fast from a young age, then you just know that that's how your body feels and it's okay. You can feel like that and everything is fine. So yes, as the question said, to, to ease them in. Um, now the days are getting shorter. It's not like in the peak of the summer. So 
you know, why don't you fast till dhuhr? Or if they can do that, why don't you on the weekends fast, you know, one whole day on the weekend. But, but during the week when you're at school, fast till dhuhr. Or then, or then maybe the second half of Ramadan, fast till asr, so on and so forth. You just have to encourage them and, you know, make sure that they have their suhoor because that's what gives them the strength. Make sure that what they eat is hearty. You know, if, you just, if you're just eating cereal for breaking your fast and cereal for sahur, I mean, you're not going to have any energy so, for the rest of the day while you're fasting. So you need to also uh, reinforce them with, with foods that will help them, inshallah. And just, you know, reward them for it and praise them for it because it's a great task, especially in our environment. When no one else around them or very few around them are also observing. I've been in the restaurant business I do not serve liquor so far, but this is a major drawback as other restaurants serve. Is it a sin to serve, although I do not drink myself? In the Hanafi madhab, uh, for Muslim minorities living in non-Muslim lands, it's permissible to sell alcohol. Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, you can't drink it. <laughs> That's haram universally. But there is dispensation in the Hanafi madhab, inshallah, for that. I heard by different imams that taking yoga classes is prohibited by Islam because it is a Buddhism practice. I do that for years and it helped me a lot to recover from my physical issues. I couldn't understand this fatwa. Please, if you explain to me, I will be very thankful. Yoga is a devotional practice that belongs to both Hinduism and or, or a, a, a largely Hindu. It's a Hindu act of worship. It's an ibadah. We are not allowed to engage in the ibadah of another religious tradition. It's as simple as that, because the philosophy, uh, the philosophy of yoga, uh, is it is meant to lead to a union with the Almighty, which for us is, is heretical. Is heret we cannot become one with God. Laisa kamithlihi shaykh. Nothing is like Allah Subhanahu. Wa ta'ala. As I said a few questions ago, when I answered the question about the other Abrahamic faiths, we are pure, absolute monotheistic faith. Allah coming in me or me going into Allah, that's all impossible. So we are not allowed to engage in the act of worship of another faith tradition. You draw some benefit from it, sure, but you can also draw the same benefit by doing other type of exercises or other, other type of physical uh, rehabilitation or slash exercises. So my advice is to seek out those other exercises or to do the exercises that help, but don't call it yoga and don't you know, don't use the language of the yogi and don't use the language of the, uh, of the yoga to avoid that we are following the act of worship of another faith tradition. Without doubt, you must believe absolutely. The Prophet said, for every ailment, there is a cure. So there is a cure for the physical ailments that you have. It's not ju just going to be in this uh, yoga, but you'll find it in, in other types of physical activity, stretching and so on and so forth. What is the Islamic ruling on in vitro fertilization? As long as it's between husband and wife, it's permissible. If it involves a third person, it becomes haram. That's just the general rule. So if a husband and wife, the, the wife's egg, the husband's sperm, it's fine. What is the ruling on a dog being in the home? Differences of opinion between the, the ulama. The dog should, if, if one wants a dog in the house, it needs to be for a reason. Uh, the, it, it barks when somebody comes to the front door. It, it guards the house. I mean, there has to be a reason, a sabab. If it's for no reason, then it will, then it, we will enter into the, you know, the disliked slash the, the haram. As long as it's for a reason, then you can have the dog. Uh, then you run into two other problems. The problem of najasa, uh, that, can be full, that can be circumnavigated by following the Maliki position in which the dog is considered pure. And then the second problem is the problem of the angels, because there's a hadith that says that the angels do not appear uh, in places where there are dogs. So if you are going to have a dog in the house, my advice would be to keep one room of the house dedicated for prayer that the dog is not allowed to go in. And then that room is where you can say your prayers. Uh, and then that way the angels will be in that space uh, and not other spaces of the house, so on and so forth. 
I am intrigued by why Arabic numerals are not used in the Quran or in Arabic textbooks, probably a historical issue. Yes, the, in, um, in countries west of Egypt, Libya, uh, Algeria, to, uh, Algeria, Tunis, Morocco, Mauritania, etc., they use the Arabic numerals in their books and in the, in the Masahif. Uh, in Egypt east, they use the Hindi numbers. Um, the exact reason why, I'm not sure. Probably because of the impact of the uh, Persia and the Hindi numbers that you know, came from. The, the, that's where the seat of the Khilafah was. You know, Baghdad, Damascus, uh, you know, the cities like Basra, Kufa. Um, probably historically that's why the, some of the books or when we started printing books for what it's worth I don't write those numbers that way I use the Arabic numerals uh, well one it's, it's you know easier for me because uh, that's I grew up in the west so I, I know I use those Arabic numerals it is becoming more popular though by the way there are you know modern books that I find published uh, in Egypt or in the Levant that are using the Arabic numerals, but it probably will never be as much as it is in the Western side, but it's, it's, that's an interesting thing. So, uh, and you, uh, we have to, I'll have to do more digging as to exactly why that happened. Why do imams discourage women to go to the cemetery during the burial process? Because they're not trained. Uh, I don't know who the, the Prophet himself said that. I used to forbid you from going to the graves. No, indeed, now go to the graves because it reminds you of death and the hereafter. So there's no basis for that. Uh, people in our culture and our background don't go to the grave and rip their clothes and yell and, and jump in the grave. I mean, if, if a woman is going to do that, or a man for that matter, then we say don't go because you can't do that at the graveyard. But no one's doing that. We go to bury the dead, to show our respects, to pray, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a great reminder. It's the greatest reminder. We all, I mean, just recently I visited our family grave plot here in Cairo. And it's a great reminder, you know, that that's where you're going to end up, you know, uh, one day. So it's, it's important to have that part of your, your uh, thinking. It's got to be there because, you know, this could be your last day. Uh, you can go to sleep and not wake up. So you want to be reminded of that, not in a morbid way, but in a way that motivates you, in a way that makes you focus, in a way that makes you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's a great act. Uh, uh, it has multiple, multiple benefits. So no, it's fine for women to go. Okay, the last question I have written here, which seems to be a multiple part question on Zakatul Mal. And then I see that the chat's going, so I'll go back to that in a second. On Zakatul Mal, is there a book on Zakatul Mal? Yani Zakat al-Mal, you will find the details, discussion of it in fiqh books. Can you suggest some English references? Um, in the Shafi Madhab, uh, Reliance of the Travelers, translated into English, translated by Sheikh Nuh Keller. And um, obviously I'm going to show my bias now because I'm not sure of the English translations of the other Madhab. But any, any Madhab of the four Madhabs of the uh, Hanafi, the Maliki, the Shafi, or the Hanbali Madhab, uh, whatever those, whatever fiqh manuals of those that have is translated in English, you will find the section of zakah because it's part of our ibadat, it's part of our acts of worship, which happens in the first part of the books. Um, can an estimated zakah tulmal be distributed equally over a year instead of one payment? Yeah, you can do that if you if you have like holdings that you know you know you know that this is sort of what it's going to be like plus or minus. Yeah, you can, you can estimate the payments and you can actually pay two years, up to two years in advance uh, for zakat al -man. So that's, that's, that's possible too. Do you purify repeatedly the same amount of money as part of zakat al -man if it is not used over a year? Yani the, the zakat, zakat al -man is the excess money after certain conditions uh, have been fulfilled. So when you have the nisab, when you have the zakatable amount, and then that zakatable amount has been in your complete ownership for one lunar year, then you're going to pay 2.5% of that. So that's extra. That, that's the purifying part. So let's say you have, I don't know, $100,000. And it's just sitting there in an account or it's sitting there in a drawer or something like that. And you know it's not going anywhere. Okay, then you're going to pay 2.5%. Next year, 
that hundred thousand dollars is minus the two point five percent that you spent, but that is still above the zakatable amount. So you're going to take another two point five percent. And if you leave it like that over time, long period of time, it will get slightly smaller and smaller and smaller. Part of the philosophy of the zakat is that it is an encouragement to use the money, to put the money into something and you know, to have the money work. So money that's just laying around gets taxed. Because there's a lot of zakat al-mal questions, maybe after Ramadan, we can have a session just on zakat, inshallah. Okay, now I see there's a lot of questions in the chat. So let me just go there. Will I still have wudu even if I touch a hamster? Yeah, touching the hamster, the hamster is pure. Even if you touch the pig or a, or a dog, you would still have wudu. You just have to wash your hands. Taba tabai? La, I'm thinking of uh, the tahrif al-Quran. Tabarsi. Let me just get the name. Fasl Khitab fi Tahrif Kitab Rabbi al Arbab by Hussein and Nuri at Tabarsi. And Nuri at Tabarsi. That was the, the scholar's name. And Nuri at Tabarsi. It's a very hard book to find. I mean, you can find a PDF version of it. But it's a book that was taken off the market uh, because many of the Shia ulama were upset that he published it. Okay, can I ask Prophet Muhammad Sassam or the awliya such as Khawja Muhyiddin Chisti to make dua for me? Yes, that's a form of tawassul. It's a form of intercession. Can daughters be given a share equal to the boys plus the one third that can be willed? Can it be given to one of their heirs? You can make a uh, bequest of up to one third of your estate. A thuluth wa thuluth kathir, the Prophet Sallallahu said. So one third, you can, you can bequest up to one third. If you want to do more than one third, then all of the people that will inherit from you must agree to that. Family planning, are women allowed to have tubal ligation procedure done in Islam? Have had three previous C-sections before. This is risky. My doctor's advised to get tubal ligation. Let me look up what that is because I'm ignorant. I apologize. Tubal ligation. Oh, tube is tied. Uh, yeah, and if it's with the doctor's uh, advice, then it's permissible. Sharia is very liberal when it comes to medical issues. So if the doctors advise that and there's risk, et cetera, then, then that's fine. Is evil eye true? What should we do to counter? Evil eye is true. Uh, and all of us have evil eye stories. Um, how do you counter that? Ayat al Kursi, al Ikhlas al Falaq al Nas. And you need something that takes the eye from the person whose eye you, you fear, who takes their eye away from, from you. So that's why a lot of people, for example, the front of their house, they put like that blue eye thing. That's where that idea comes from, is that. You're walking and then you see something and it distracts you, even if it's for a moment. That moment of distraction has taken the energy away from that person to that thing. Uh, I've, you know, I've witnessed evil eye stuff uh, all the time. Uh, it, yeah, it, it happens. But, but the protection against it is quite easy. So let's look at the home, for example. I mean, just as an example. So usually if you have something at the entrance of the home, either outside or right inside, I mean, depending on how your house is or apartment or whatever that's that's an easy way that will just sort of just deflect deflect the person's energy because the evil eye is a type of energy that comes out from the person known to them or unbeknownst to them so other than 
آية الكرسي الإخلاص الفرق الناس that's one way you can protect against it can I can I help protect adults with آية الكرسي and the other prayers if they've forgotten to pray for themselves of course you, you, the Prophet said whoever can help their brother or sister then let them help them so this is a form of helping them yeah and some of some of our teachers, you know, would recite prayers for us and on our behalf uh, all the time. So this, that's a great thing to be done. Is it bad in Islam to be ambitious? No. The Prophet ﷺ said, ask and ask al-Firdaus al-A'la. Right? Ask the highest, uh, highest uh, level of paradise. That's very ambitious <laughs> because, you know, we know that we're not deserving of that. So based on that, no, we have to, if the, if the Muslims weren't ambitious, they wouldn't have conquered, you know, North Africa and Andalus and Constantinople and all and gone east to, all the way to China. And that was part of their ambition. Um, you have to think really, really big and, and you have to be very ambitious, but for the right reasons. So you have to have the right intention. All actions are based on intention, but there's nothing wrong with having ambition. Who, who amongst us is not ambitious? And I've said it many times, my ambition is that, you know, our message is the best message in, in North America. You know, what's wrong with that? Because it's going to strive. And then when somebody else at another message sees that, that we openly say that, they're going to feel like, well, we want to be the best message, right? Well, Allah says, in these matters that are good, let them, you know, compete with one another. So by us being ambitious, for the right reasons, we encourage other peoples to also be ambitious. So we've just raised the, the, the level of our quality so much. So no, we should be ambitious for the right reasons, inshallah. Is there a hadith about when you pray that Allah is in front of you? How should I think about this when Allah doesn't need space? We pray towards a direction. Uh, uh, Allah being in front of us is for us to remember that Allah is with me, that Allah is observing me, not that Allah is in a space, but it's it's a it's a turn of phrase, like the hadith that we just mentioned, hadith al-Rahma, yarhamkum man fi sama. You know, the one in the heavens will show mercy to you. But Allah is not in the sama, but by saying the one in the heavens, it means that Allah Taala is elevated. It's the type of speech that elevates Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So when you say Allah is in front of you, what you're saying is Allah is observing me, he sees me and he hears me. Not that he's in a space. La hawla la quwata illa billah is often used in conversations. Please explain the context. Well, it depends. If your parents are yelling at you, they say la hawla la quwata illa billah. You know, that means that they're very disappointed in you. <laughs> so it, it's a common uh, term, it's a common phrase that we use because at the end, there's no power or ability except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, when something bad happens or when something negative happens, usually it's like inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, uh, as the Quran states, with asabatun musibatun. You know, if a, if a calamity befalls them, they say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Or when something bad happens, we say because we, we are acknowledging that that could, that we couldn't have stopped that. Only Allah Ta'ala has the ability to stop something like that. There is no power but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, yeah, that's sort of how we, we come to use it. How would you recommend a person starts doing more in their Islam? I pray the Fard of the prayers and the minimum, but I feel I should do more. Well, if you pray the Fard of the prayers, you can try to pray some of the Sunnah prayers. Um, but, uh, in the complex age that we live in, the complex time that we live in, dhikr is the best tool that we have. So I, I believe that this is the age of dhikr. This is the age of, of when we need to make more invocation. You know, by starting in the morning, by saying astaghfirullah a hundred times, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah a hundred times, doing a hundred salawat on the Prophet, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa Ali, a hundred times, la ilaha illallah a hundred times, Doing that in the morning and the evening. Try that. Uh, and then build, build from there. If you can do more than that, then add more prayers on the Prophet during the day. But be consistent. You know, the best of actions are those 
that are consistent, even if they are few. Can we use prescription eye drops during the day, during Ramadan, if we forget to do it at night? Yeah, Imam al-Shafi, he said that the, the eye duct uh, does not constitute the body cavity, but the mouth, the ear, and you know, uh, uh, the, the privates would constitute the, uh, a body cavity. But the eye duct, the, the water going into the eye duct, it comes usually down the nose. Imam al-Shafi uh, did not uh, consider that to be part of the body cavity and therefore using eye drops during the fasting day or while you're fasting does not invalidate the fast, inshallah. If I change a baby's diaper while wearing disposable gloves, will this still break my wudu? No, because you, there is a ha'il, there is a something between you and the, and the private part of the child. What breaks your wudu is that if your, your hand, if you put both of your hands together, whatever is touching the other hand, if, if, if whatever's outside touches the, the baby's body uh, private part does not break your wudu. What invalidates is this. So you could even, you know, if you touched it like that, it wouldn't invalidate your wudu. If you wore gloves, it wouldn't invalidate your wudu. Is there a hadith about when you pray? No, we got the other, we got that hadith. It's a repeat. Asking to be deserving of the highest heaven, I get that. But how about a worldly ambition such as a promotion at work or an example? For the right reason. And you, you don't want to be, the Prophet ﷺ sought refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from poverty. Because poverty is very debilitating. And, and it, it puts so much pressure on the person that it's difficult for them to, to live an upright, you know, decent life. So not wanting to be in poverty, having lawful gain, to be able to support yourself, your family, to be able to support the charitable works that you want, to be able to support your masjid. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all lofty reasons. But, you know, I, I want... Um, I want um, this special job, you know, so I can show everyone how great I am. That's not a so good reason. That's your nafs speaking. So it's about the intention. In al amalu all actions are nothing but their intentions. That's what the hadith means. So what's your intention for wanting that? For being ambitious. You have to be ambitious. Imam Al Ghazali says, if you're not ambitious, if you don't have that drive in you, something's wrong with you. Uh, if you don't get angry, then he says you're not normal because normal people get angry. The question is what you do with that anger. So the same thing here. If you're not ambitious, if you have no ambitious, you're not normal. Something is not right. You're sort of like vanilla. If everything's like, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. If everything's like that, then that's not, that's not a normal disposition. There has to be something that lights your fire. Maybe you haven't found it yet, so on and so forth. <clears throat> but that passion and that drive, that ambition, that's what leads to excellence. Because if you, if you have passion for something, and especially if it's supported by the right intention, then inshallah, you'll accomplish great things with it. So there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Again, it all comes back to your intention. So those are the questions that I have before me. Is there anything that somebody wants clarified? I'm, I'm sorry, some of the questions took a little bit longer to answer. Oh, there's another question. If I make adhkar for protection from the evil, like the jinn, evil eye, et cetera, am I completely protected? <clears throat> what I'm confused about is that what if someone still harms me because Allah willed it? Then you're entering into the level of wiswas. You have to trust that, that the Prophet Sallallahu and what Allah Ta'ala says is true. You know, Sadaqallahu al-Azim, we say when we finish the recitation of the Quran. So, you can't live you know, in fear like that. If you take these basic protections, you will be protected because the jinn, the evil line, all of that stuff don't have power over the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't have power over those things. So if you're, if you're making your five prayers a day, if you, most of the day you're in a state of wudu, if you uh, are reciting ayat al-kursi, al-ikhlas al-falaq al-nas, khalas, I mean, that's your protection. You don't need more than that. If Allah wants something to happen, doesn't matter what you do, it's going to happen. That's qadr. You know, khayrihi wa sharrihi. We believe in qadr, it's good and it's bad. It's sweet and it's bitter. So that's la hawla la quwata illa billah. But you can't go, 
you know, along the day, all the time, always thinking about it like that, it's going to be too overwhelming. So inshallah, you'll be okay. Thank you for clarifying. We are free to ask of Allah as long as it's from a clean heart. Yes, inshallah. Inshallah. Think about what the people before us did in human history. Think about the fact that everything we know about Western philosophy came from the preservation of that philosophy from the Muslims, which means that Muslims encountered foreign language, learned the foreign language to the point that they could translate that work into Arabic, primarily, but also Farsi, commented on that, used that, added to that, and it is those translations and those translations alone that that, that philosophy still remains. Think about the fact that the Muslims of Al Andalus saved the Hebrew language. That it were, if it were not for them, the Hebrew language would have disappeared. Uh, the Jews of the Andalus used to write Hebrew using Arabic letters. And it was the free space that Islam afforded the Jews of Spain that allowed them to be able to revive Hebrew once again. Uh, think of the inventions and think of the civilization and the architecture and the art and the poetry and the music, uh, the literature that came from our ancestors. And that came from ambition. That came from internalizing the Quran and the Sunnah that unleashed this creative power and unlocked this, this potential. So we need to be those people, but today. Uh, uh, and to bring sanity to an insane world. You, that will only happen if we are ambitious. So as long as our intentions, we're thinking like on those level, on that level, yeah, I want to do something great and I, I want to, you know, I want this to benefit the, the ummah and et cetera, et cetera. Allah Ta'ala inshallah will facilitate for you. Anybody else? Uh, Imam, uh, Imam Tariq. No. Uh, Imam Tariq. Um, yes, Brother Hassan. Since last uh, Ramadan, uh, we've had an unbroken um, monthly session of Ask Dr. Tariq. And I did a rough count. There have been a minimum of 500 questions which have been answered. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm usually bad at math. But this one, I got it properly checked. And 500 plus questions have been asked and answered by you. And on, on, an, on an average, at least 40 to 50 people watch these sessions. And if you think that in a household, there are two people watching, then you have 100 people uh, um, watching this program. Um, and I know that since you moved to Egypt, uh, you get up at this hour, at the Hajjat time, uh, to, to, to devote your time to us. And uh, I ask this dua on behalf of everybody, including those who are not here, but who listen to it online uh, for the service that you have done and for the patience with which Farida and the children have allowed you to do this uh, from a distance. I also want to say that uh, we really admire the way you and uh, Imam Rifai and uh, Kari Anas work together on these because some of the questions that are asked of them, they deflect them to you. And if you get more questions, <laughs> it's because they are outsourcing their questions to you and you can do the same to them as well. But uh, we really, really wanted to say uh, thank you to you and may Allah bless you. Look forward to your coming back. And uh, Imam Rifai and uh, Sister Zamruda and the team, I have prepared an exciting Ramadan program uh, of which you will also be part and cent center, central to it. So inshallah, we will see you in a few weeks. Inshallah, thank you. Uh, I, I had no idea that we've, we've had them unbroken. I, I, uh, ha had you told me a year ago that we have this planned for the year, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite surprised. 
Uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah is merciful and, and generous. And um, as I always say, I am grateful to the community for this opportunity. Uh, it's these questions that allow me to stay sharp and to uh, uh, formulate these answers and articulate uh, what I believe is important. So I, I am in much of need of them as, as everyone else. So Alhamdulillah, it's a great blessing upon all of us. And um, it's absolutely my pleasure. Well, it's not such a pleasure to get up in the middle of the night, I must say. But, but after the first few minutes of waking up, I'm you know, looking forward to being with everyone. And inshallah, soon I'll be with everyone uh, at the end uh, of the month, you know, as Brother Mustan said. So uh, we ask Allah Ta'ala to continue to bless our community and our families. And, and we ask Allah to bless us in this month of Shaban and to bring us safely to the month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to accept our our acts of worship, our prayer, and our zakah, and our fasting. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this, uh, this Ramadan a month of victory over ourselves. You know, Ramadan is traditionally the month of victory. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that victory over ourselves and to continue to protect our families and our parents and our, uh, our children and to have mercy on those who we, we love who have passed before us, inshallah. Uh, there's just one question I think that came in. I just wanted to answer that. Uh, for the dog question, when it says the angels don't enter the house, what is the defin defined as the house, like with a garage or extension building that people don't usually live in it be included as part of the house or the angels don't enter? No, the hadith is where, where the, the angels don't occupy the same space as the house, as the dog. One of the hadiths of Gabriel was coming to the Prophet Sassan with revelation, but there was a dog like by him or under the bed, so Gabriel didn't come in because of the presence of the dog, there is some sort of relationship between angels and dogs that the angels don't come with. That's the meaning of the hadith. So wherever the dog is, then that's not going to be a spot where the angel is going to be. But dogs are, cre are creatures. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, were it not that the dogs are an ummah like you, I would have asked you to remove them or to, or to, you know, to, 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 to kill them. So the Prophet ﷺ referred to dogs as an ummah. Like us, like we are an ummah of people. They're an ummah of dogs. They're Allah's creation. We use dogs for hunting. We use dogs for guarding. We use dogs for guidance. So it doesn't mean that something is wrong with the dog, but there is that natural association uh, between the dog and the, and the angel. So wherever the dog is going to be, the angel is not going to be. So therefore, if we have a dog in the house, let us, keep the let us keep one room for the prayer. So that's the prayer. That's the room of the baraka, the room of the angels, so on and so forth. And that space idea, by the way, is real. I mean, there are, uh, I have been in spaces that have only been used for prayer, only been used for dhikr. And you feel something different when you're in that space than when you're like at a Starbucks or something like that. There's, there's definitely that exists. So uh, we honor the spaces that we're in. Uh, and that's just one way of honoring them, inshallah. And thank you, uh, Rafai and Enes, for uh, outsourcing or, or sending all these questions. Now I know who to blame when I'm back, inshallah. So thank you for the added work. Uh, and um, <laughs> anytime, Rafai says anytime. And I, I'm looking forward to, to being with everyone. I, I have some, some things planned. Even as I was preparing for this session, I was thinking about the Ramadan khatiras and, and this and that. I'm already getting emails about there's an iftar here and an iftar. So I'm already sort of festive in the Ramadan mood, inshallah. So I look forward to being with everyone soon, inshallah. And um, uh, we continue our Sunday sessions uh, until right before Ramadan, inshallah. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك ومداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Take care.